I'm a Navy man, and in the Navy we name our pretty much everything. We name ships. When I bought these craft, and I do consider them craft, and they are, uh, they are aircraft, uh, I was going to name them after battleships, states. Uh, my daughter, however, intervened, and she's seven, and she said, well, um, we're going to call this one Rainbow, and we're going to call this one Pinkie Pie. <laughs> and, and so I can't really go against my daughter. I haven't quite put the names on there yet, but I suspect she's going to hold me to that. The picture you see here is the Eagle Bluff Lighthouse in Peninsula State Park in Door County, Wisconsin, just outside of Fish Creek. Uh, I, vis I visited that lighthouse recently with my family, my, my wife and daughter, and had an amazing tour from a gentleman who uh, was a docent there at the lighthouse. And it, it brought me very close to what I'm working with on drones. If you think about the history of our country, um, the drone business actually can go back many, many years, but I'm going to take you back to 1789. Lighthouses were originally a beacon to help mariners avoid crashes, avoid collisions. And if you think about aviation and, and seamanship, uh, avoiding those kinds of incursions, collisions, is critically important. The most famous lighthouse probably in the world, uh, and I didn't know it was a lighthouse until I started doing this research, is the Statue of Liberty. If you think about what happens when you're seeing a lighthouse, if you're a mariner, the first thing it does, and George Washington saw this, and it's in the history, he said, lighthouses for the United States, and particularly on the East Coast, are a beacon of hope. But imagine coming here and being on a ship that may or may not make it across, and you see that light. Imagine what that must have felt like. That's what I think about, believe it or not, when I think about drones, because all of you have seen them, and you're thinking, oh, another drone? I can't believe it, they're over the fireworks, they're doing this, they're doing that, they're not, op they're not doing things the right way. George Washington created the United States Lighthouse Establishment, the very first lighthouse organization in our country. Lighthouses have bounced around between the Department of the Treasury, and they did an okay job with it. It moved to the Department of uh, Commerce, uh, and ultimately it has landed where it is today, which is with the United States Coast Guard. The lighthouse that you saw previously at Eagle Bluff, actually the very top of the lighthouse is federal property, the rest of it is state property. And once a year the Coast Guard goes up and does their magic and makes it work. And people still use these thousand plus lighthouses in America uh, frequently. This is probably one of the most famous coaches, not named Belichick or Lombardi, this is Newt Rockney. Newt Rockney is, is an amazing historical coach in our country's history. Uh, he was uh, very famously helped propel the use of the forward pass. I'm a huge football fan, both college and pro, as my wife is a huge Chicago Bears fan. Um, and unfortunately, Coach Rockney, after he had an unbelievable run at Notre Dame and really made Notre Dame a national powerhouse in the 1920s, was killed in an air crash on March 31st, 1931. He had just gotten done visiting his sons in Kansas City, who were in boarding school, and was actually on his way to California, to Hollywood, to uh, get to a screening of a movie about Notre Dame football from the previous decade. The aircraft that he was in was a TWA flight. There were seven souls aboard. All were killed when the wing separated from the aircraft. The outcry in our country was unbelievable. A 15-year-old man named Joseph Harkins, a young man named Joseph Harkins growing up in coal country in Pennsylvania, decided not long after to go into aviation as an aeronautical engineer. He went to the University of Alabama. If you grew up in Pennsylvania, in coal country, you didn't go to the University of Alabama, but he did. Um, that was my grandfather. And in 1937, he graduated from the University of Alabama with a degree in aeronautical engineering. Went on to World War II and helped build planes in World War II, and my service to my country is directly tied to his service to our country. The death of Newt Rockney and the, the, this air crash spurred incredible development in safety of airplanes. 
most of the developments, the most of the positive developments of aviation in our country happen as a result, frankly, of death. It's sad, but it's part of American commerce. It's a part of our developing our economy. When ships were crashing along the coastlines across our country, we didn't say stop the ships. We said figure it out. We're doing the same thing with drones. We're not saying, some people are saying don't fly, but our country is not built upon don't do the thing that's dangerous, figure out a way to make it safer. These two aircraft, th these two aircraft actually collided over the Grand Canyon on June 30th, 1956. All souls were lost. They were flying under visual flight rules. For those pilots in the room, that means see and avoid. Through a very unfortunate set of circumstances, these two planes took off from Los Angeles at nearly the same time, ended up over the Grand Canyon, one went left around a cloud, the other went right around the same cloud, and they ended up encouraging with each other. It took two more years for the Federal Aviation Administration to be formed. That's amazing to me that the outcry would not have been stronger. But it did take two years, and in 1958, the FAA was formed. Drone. So I am proudly now immersing myself in the drone business. To fly drones today for commercial benefit, you actually have to be a pilot, an FAA-certificated pilot. I'm not yet. I have 37 hours under my belt. I'm working very hard to get there. But a lot of people are flying drones for commercial businesses, real estate, construction, so on, that don't have a pilot's license. You are putting yourself and your organizations at incredible risk if you do so. You've all seen the headlines. I'm not going to read them. They are all true headlines that I have pulled from various articles. This is the crux of my conversation today. This is the town of West Texas. The town of West Texas is actually not in West Texas. It's in Central Texas, not far from Waco. Town of 2,800 people, 1.6 square miles, teeny tiny town. It is similar to towns across America just like it. In the middle there, you see a rail, railroad. That railroad was laid in 1880. Now, you can argue whether the railroad came first or the town came first, but whatever, they came together in 1880, the Missouri-Kansas-Texas Railroad. If you look to the, the uh, picture up, that is the fertilizer plant that on April 17th caught fire. And I'm going to come back to that. This is the fertilizer plant the next day. At 7.30 p.m. on April 17th, the fire broke out. And coincidentally, there was actually an emergency management meeting happening in the town with a bunch of, of volunteer firefighters from the area. They immediately went to go fight the fire at 7.50 and 38 seconds, and they know this because it was a two on the Richter scale at nearby universities, a, uh, containers of ammonium nitrate exploded, killed 12 firefighters almost instantly, killed three other residents, destroyed, damaged or destroyed over 150 buildings. I'm going to take a quick turn. If you see here, I'm, my otherwise nice outfit, my wife said, you're going to do what? I'm wearing my combat boots. These are actually my actual combat boots from Iraq that I wore in 2005 and 2006. Tucked here in the middle is a dog tag. My dog tag. Dog tags are incredibly important to the American military man and woman. That's my dog tag you see on the screen there. It's got some interesting information. My name, I've blacked out my social security number, which they don't even do anymore. Um, my, uh, my service, my blood type, and my religion. Uh, I have a set of these by my bedside uh, that I look at every morning when I wake up and I look at every night before I go to bed. I lost 15 men and women in Iraq. Um, there were 15 people killed in West Texas. Uh, that's a very important number for me personally. You, you saw uh, earlier that I'm a retired Master Chief. Some of you may recognize this man. This is Carl Brashear, probably, certainly for me, the most heroic uh, and the finest example of Master Chief in the Navy. He was a Navy diver. Uh, the movie Men of Honor was made about him. For those of you who are in the services, if you, were a sergeant, if, you, if you were in the Army or the Marine Corps, you know Master Chiefs as Sergeants Major. Uh, I consider Master Chief uh, to be the rank and Sergeants Major and Chief Master Sergeants for our Air Force uh, brothers and sisters, to be the rank that is most important for taking care of troops, taking care of sailors, soldiers, airmen, Marine, Coast Guardsmen. And I took that 
responsibility very seriously. This is a fire truck in Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, interestingly, Montgomery County is actually using drones today. They have three of them that they're using to deploy in various areas. Photography and video, situational awareness, something called forward-looking infrared radar, hazardous materials response and incidences, suspicious packages, construction accidents. I believe within five years, every fire company in America is going to have some sort of drone that they will have trained on and have available to their crew to help save lives. I want to make sure that people have every tool in their toolbox that they possibly can to get home at night to their kids, to get home to their families. I talked earlier about losing 15 people in Iraq. Um, nothing harder than that, nothing harder than those services that I had to give. I want to make sure that we can, and these are the deaths in West Texas were preventable. Now, they didn't have very much time, but in a lot of these situations, you do have the luxury of time to put an aircraft in the air, and there are examples of this have happened already on the East Coast and other places, where, you, where the fire chief can get situational awareness to understand where chemicals are before they actually detonate. This is the aftermath of West Texas. This is an example of a, an ambulance that had, this was a trade show, obviously, by the carpet, um, but they actually had a drone that's integral to it. Uh, it fits into the top of this vehicle so that it charges properly and can be accessed easily. My call to action to you. You're seeing drones more and more in your parks, over your homes, uh, different places. Certainly the privacy issues have to be resolved. Certainly the training issues have to be resolved. Certainly the issues of aviation incursions have to be solved. But there are men and women like me around the country trying to embrace this technology safely to go about and change and improve people's lives. I believe that drones and drone technology, whether it's chemical, sniffers, FLIR, forward-looking infrared radar to understand hot spots of fires, photography and video, I believe that these tools will save lives and help men and women, our first responders, our military, as they're helping today, it will help them get home safely to their families. As a retired Navy Master Chief, as a Master Chief uh, uh, for the rest of my life, uh, I am focused and driven on making sure that our first responders and the people that are protecting us have the tools that they need to be successful. And I hope that you'll join me in making sure that they have those tools. Even if it makes you feel a little uncomfortable, at the end of the day, the right people will be doing this, learning it, training it, and our country, in every single case, has overcome the negative challenges for the, bet for the betterment and benefit of our country. Thank you.